Hi everyone, this is a supplementary lecture on ecological succession. Last time I introduced the concept of a community and some of its emergent properties. In this, this lecture I want to continue that discussion by focusing on how ecological communities change over time. If you've ever visited a natural area and then returned years later, you may have noticed that it changed, maybe a little, maybe a lot. If it's a forested area, trees probably got bigger or maybe a few had gotten blown over in a storm and new trees were establishing in, in their place. Or as we've seen recently in the severe fires that ravaged communities in Northern and Southern California, and as pictured in this photo, a fire may have moved through the forested area and damaged or destroyed many of the trees, leaving charred earth and the remnants of the forest, uh, former forest behind. If enough time went by after the fire, you might have noticed that um, new plants had begun to recolonize the area. A great place nearby to see a plant community that's currently in the process of coming back af uh, after a fire is at Stebbins Coldwater Canyon Preserve near Lake Berryessa. That area burned several years ago and you can see uh, quite striking evidence of a lot of regeneration of the plant species and animal species returning to the area. So ecological communities are constantly changing over time. This is a process called succession. Succession is the replacement of one community by another over time. And by community, of course, we're talking about an ecological assemblage of, of species um, in a particular area. This graphic shows, um, so for example, maybe a, an open field that was cleared um, perhaps in the East Coast after um, it was cleared for agricultural agriculturists or, or um, such and was allowed to return to the pr previous um, uh, mixed deciduous forest. So over time you begin with um, smaller plants followed by um, long, you know, l shorter lived plants initially and followed by longer lived plants later. Eventually maybe shrubs and small trees move in and eventually longer live trees and so forth. This is a process that is quite common um, and is the rule rather than the exception in ecological communities. Succession occurs in a transitional series of communities and we call this a chrono sequence. That is a sequence, chronological sequence that is, of ecological communities over time. If we look at any given succession, it occurs in a characteristic sequence of, of these stages. On a given site and under a given set of climatic conditions, a chrono sequence ultimately leads to a terminal or what's sometimes referred to as a climax community. This is an example from old fields, which are abandoned agricultural fields. And you can see many of these on the East Coast, you could probably also see some here in the Central Valley as some um, agricultural fields are left fallow and sometimes allowed to return to the former vegetation. So let's just take a look at the progression of a succession in, in this old field as, as pictured here. So the first picture is, is a plowed field. And um, if we roll the clock forward several years, say zero to five years, um, in these first few years, we see annual herbs and grasses um, begin to establish in this old field. And these tend to be annual species, um, species that live for a single year, sometimes a couple years. Between five and 15 years, what we see uh, occurring in these old fields is that a perennial, that is, um, species that live for plant species that live for more than one year, um, perennial grasses and herbs, shrubs and so forth begin to establish and displace the earlier annual species of herbs and grasses. At around 15 to 30 years, um, shrubs begin to invade and small trees. This picture um, shows, you can't probably see it too well, but these are western red cedar. Uh, in the, on the east coast, 
uh, mid-latitudes in the East Coast. These are very common tree species to occur um, and, and um, begin to establish between about 15 to 30 years after um, the field is allowed to return to its former um, forested condition. These species, it turns out, these western red cedar are bird dispersed, and so um, this is one of the mechanisms that uh, uh, disperses their seeds into these areas. And then birds begin to chirp, uh, chirp, <laughs> begin to perch on, on these uh, red cedars and um, bring in other um, seeds from other species and deposit them at the bases of these trees. And so this is a process by which um, new um, seeds can be dispersed, bird dispersed, into these locations. Between 30 and 60 or so years um, in these uh, abandoned fields on the East Coast, we tend to um, get smaller trees, soft woods, um, soft wooded trees like red maple and um, tulip poplar. These are common earlier uh, species that uh, when they establish, what they'll do is outshade the shrubs and smaller trees like the red cedar. And um, once they do, of course, they, they outcompete them, overtop them, and then eventually um, become the dominance in, in the forest. So at this point, we start seeing um, the forest canopy develop, and eventually it will become a closed canopy forest. After 60, 70 or so years, what happens is that hardwoods begin to establish in the understory of the softwoods. And um, these are very, very long-lived species, such as um, beech and various species of oaks and hickories, that um, begin to establish in the understory of these softwood forests and um, eventually outlive the softwoods. They're very long live trees, as I mentioned, four or five hundred years um, in, and even older. And so what eventually happens is that these hardwoods replace the earlier softwoods. And at this point, um, this would be considered the climax or terminal community under the prevailing conditions that exist on the East Coast. So this is um, a, a fairly long um, term succession, a, a chrono sequence that involves quite a few different stages of different types of plant species that have different um, life history traits um, and so forth. So uh, let's look into the, this phenomenon a little bit deeper. This graph shows the change in species abundance as quantified by total percent cover over time from 1958 to about the mid-1990s. This data is um, taken from what's called the Buell Small Succession Study, and this is one of the longest um, studies of succession, continuous studies of succession over time that exists. And this was conducted at the Hutchison Memorial Forest in New Jersey by um, researchers at Rutgers University. The study began in 1958, and um, it's still ongoing. The data presented here is from 1958 until the mid-1990s. I had the good fortune, actually, of participating in this study as a graduate student. I conducted my um, PhD research at Rutgers University and worked with um, several of the faculty that were involved in this study. So a number of us graduate students were, were involved in collecting data um, right towards the end of this uh, of the graph here graph here in you know the mid 1990s so let's take a look um, at what's going on here this this broadly uh, reflects the um, chrono sequence that I just explained in the previous slide um, these are all these are data from abandoned fields um, and in in the earliest stages, um, starting in 1958, we're, we're quantifying, you can see that we, what's being quantified here is total percent cover uh, of, for four different um, categories of species, trees, shrubs, herbs, and vines. And what you'll notice is, again, as, as was indicated in the previous slide, um, herbs are the dominant 
um, types of species early in succession. So they're the first establishing species. First annual herbs and grasses followed by um, biennial and maybe some perennial species as well begin to colonize and, and establish. We call these pioneer species. They're sort of the first pioneers, the first arrivals uh, that establish. Uh, and these are uh, fairly small, uh, fast-growing, short-lived species. They produce many small seeds. They have very good dispersal, and they tend to be quite shade tolerant. Now, this should sound familiar to, uh, to you, I hope, in terms of life history traits. Um, these pioneer species tend to fit um, the classic R type of species, those that are putting a lot of resources into reproduction and dispersal. So uh, they're able to arrive first because they have um, good dispersal. Uh, they can colonize these new areas that open up from um, you know, a, a, a disturbance perhaps or a clearing of an agricultural field in this, in this situation. If we roll the clock forward, we see, um, as, as I outlined in the previous chrono sequence, that eventually, um, and this is about 10 to 15 years in, we start to see that these herbs uh, begin to get outcompeted by shrubs, maybe some small trees and vines. And so you can see that trees, shrubs, and vines are starting to increase in abundance, and correspondingly the herbs are starting to decline quite dramatically. After about 40 years, which is about as far as these data go, we see that we reach, um, we're starting to reach this um, theoretical climax community. That is the community that would be expected under the prevailing conditions in this area. And that would be that these forests would, well then they would be, these would become forests um, at this stage, uh, in the in the late you know mid late 90s, we're about 40 years out. So these are probably softwood trees, red maple and tulip poplar and so forth. Um, eventually, uh, uh, the hardwoods will begin to um, come in, and we'll reach that ultimate climax community. So when we think about cereal stages, we often, um, they're, they're related to the kinds of traits that species have. So as I indicated for pioneer species, these are sort of our selected species. The species that um, we find in the climax community are um, more like K selected species. Um, if you recall the, the K selected life history um, characteristics, we're talking about fairly large, long-lived, slow-growing species. Those that produce relatively large seeds with lots of um, uh, stored resources for establishment in a very competitive environment. They tend to have limited dispersal and they're rather shade tolerant, which of course as a life history trait makes sense if you're trying to establish in a underneath an existing canopy. So uh, these two kind of contrasting cereal stages, the pioneer species stage and the climax community species stage, um, have very different, um, have species with very different life history traits. And in a very general way, these are associated with R selected for pioneer species early in succession, K um, uh, species or more competitive species um, in um, as we approach the climax community. When we talk about succession and studies of succession, of course, studies like the Buell uh, study are very difficult because, you know, to maintain a continuous sampling regime um, over decades uh, requires a lot of organization, money, time, and so forth. And so not every, not every, um, successional study can be observed directly. Uh, sometimes successions are observed or studied indirectly. An example of this is um, some work that was done by uh, Henry Chandler Cowles in the um, late 1800s. In fact, Cowles was one of the first 
to really study succession in any kind of extensive detail and did so on um, coastal dunes along the um, shores of Lake Michigan. After studying these coastal systems for some years, Cowles realized that uh, du dunes, these dunes were formed by the de deposition of sand uh, on the near shore, and that over time these sands would continually be deposited. This continuous deposition built up the dunes uh, and created a uh, situation in which new dunes continually formed on, on the lake side, such that the older dunes were further away from the shore. He was able to argue that nearest the shore were the earliest stages of succession, and that farther from the shore, going back on the fore dune and the hind dunes, that these um, exhibited later stages of succession. So he argued that um, these incipient dunes were, um, again, early stages of succession and represented the sort of present conditions, obviously, in the most um, immediate berms, and that you essentially were walking backwards in time or backwards in successional time as you moved away from the lake's edge towards the hind dunes. And so he argued that this was um, exhibiting a succession from early species, uh, these early pioneer species on the incipient dunes, which included grasses and creepers and so forth, to more middle successional species like the shrubs and short-lived trees on the fore dunes. And in the hind dunes, um, which were the oldest, those included the long-lived species, long-lived trees um, where the f a forest community had had enough time to establish. This is generally referred to as what's called a space for time substitution. And what this means is that different locations on the ground um, represent different times since the initial establishment of the community. So it really is representative of, of a successional sequence. It's just that you're seeing the successional sequence over space rather than measuring it over time. It's important to note that together with changes in plant species, uh, abundances, composition, and so forth, that animal succession occurs as well and as a response to changes in plant species, uh, composition and abundance and so forth. This graphic kind of illustrates that. Um, it's showing a plant community um, over succession, successional time from a bare field on the left through grasslands, grasses, shrubs, pine forests, and eventually the climax community, oak hickory forests, where um, you have vastly different um, species that support um, very different types of animal communities. Succession occurs, um, or, th or there's basically sort of two types of succession that are generally r recognized, primary succession and also secondary succession. So primary succession, we actually just saw an example of that on, on the coastal dunes that Cowles studied. Primary succession occurs on brand new geological substrates or materials with um, that are basically nearly abiotic. There, there are no um, propagules, in other words, no seeds or vegetative structures from which uh, a community can establish. So every species that um, establishes on those new geological materials must come in from, from elsewhere. And sand dunes are a good example of this because of the brand new um, sand that's deposited along the coastlines of lakes or oceans. Um, and so all of the species that establish in these on these sands uh, must come in from somewhere else. They're not inherently there to begin with. Another example um, comes from volcanic eruptions uh, and um, the deposition of brand new geologic parent material is pretty obvious here in the form of magma um, or 
major debris flows and that sort of thing that deposit new geologic material on the landscape. And the only way that um, a community can establish, whether it be microbial plant or animal, um, it must come in from, from somewhere else. So this is referred to as a primary succession. Secondary succession occurs um, where there was a previous community. And so this is often seen when um, different kinds of events, which we'll talk about later um, called disturbances, sort of reset the ecological clock. And um, so examples of this would be fires, floods, storms, um, and so forth that basically destroy or kill virtually all, um, most or all of the, the species in the community and the community reestablishes re from there. But there are existing propagules, there are vegetative materials, um, you know, viable materials in the soil, seeds in, in what's called the seed bank, um, seeds stored in the soil that can um, germinate and grow following um, one of these types of disturbances. The Yellowstone fires um, of 1988 um, formed one of the largest wildfires in recorded history in Yellowstone National Park in the United States. In fact, it, it burned over 790,000 acres. Um, this was more than 3,200 square kilometers, which uh, equated to about 36% of the park area that was affected by these fires. They started as many small individual fires um, due to, uh, but due to drought and, and winds, the flames quickly spread out of control and increased um, in one sort of large conflagration, which burned, um, actually burned for months. Fires of this m extent and magnitude don't occur very often. And um, the return interval for such a fire for the Yellowstone area is considered to be between 100 and 500 years. So um, th that means that um, a fire of this magnitude isn't expected to happen very often. It's important to note, however, despite the fact that they were so destructive, um, that the Yellowstone fires were rather ecologically restorative. There were um, quite a few um, phenomena that occurred um, after the fire. Uh, and, and in fact, fire, what fire can do uh, is that it can clear dead trees and, and leaf litter. It can open up the canopy and allow sunlight to reach the forest floor and, and help prepare soil for new growth and, and recycling of nutrients. The, the mineral-rich ash produced by the fire can infuse nutrients into the soil and it creates a, an environment that is actually uh, uh, quite, um, uh, quite ideal for um, the regeneration of plants and the germination of seeds. Fire also can remove weak and unhealthy um, and insect-ridden trees and it can reduce competition, potential infestations, and, and so forth. And it can also um, you know, reduce the chance of, of repeated fires. This happens by, um, you know, reducing the fuel load in these forests. So let's, let's take a look at the response um, of a forest in Yellowstone to this, um, such a disturbance. So the first stage in, in the chrono sequence um, in these forests is that initially what we find in the first year is that a group of species that are annual species called post-fire annuals begin to establish. Uh, an example of that is fireweed. And um, fireweed is a, 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 a actually a quite pretty plant. Um, it has a nice pink flower and it commonly flourishes in the, fall, uh, the years following a fire. Um, fireweed earned its name because it quickly sprouts after fire and, and other disturbance events. It's pretty common throughout most of the U.S. Um, and it's considered a pioneer species that thrives in open areas, takes advantage of reduced tree canopies and, and so forth. There are other species as well like Indian paintbrush, lupin, and columbine that can also sprout um, after, after a fire. Some of these even have vegetative structures below ground that if, if the fire isn't 
too hot to, to kill off the, those vegetative structures, they can actually re-sprout um, from vegetation, vegetative structures below ground. Um, what was also observed in the first year after the, the Yellowstone fire was that um, there were um, aspen trees began to re-sprout. And if you know anything about aspen, um, you, you probably know that it is a clonal species. That is that it, it produces, um, it, it actually grows vegetatively and the, the, the trunks that you see above ground are actually quite often the same individual, um, just re-sprouting from vegetative material below ground. So this began, um, this, this happened as well, and, and um, so in the first year, post-fire annuals and aspen re-sprouts began to, to come in and recolonize the area. About five years later, um, an interesting observation was made. Aspen seedlings began to pop up in, in many new locations, and this wasn't expected because up until that point, um, scientists had never really observed aspen recruiting from seed. They had always only ever seen it um, uh, respond uh, vegetatively or, or to, to, to be recruited vegetatively. So it appeared that fire was um, playing a particularly important role in its uh, sexual reproduction. Um, lodgepole pine is a very common species in this area, and so after the fire, many lodgepole pine seedlings and subsequently saplings began to establish. Twenty years out, lodgepole pine um, was forming very dense stands, in fact so dense that there was a process of self-thinning that um, was happening in certain areas where an enormous number of seedlings had established initially, and then there was a self-thinning process that um, occurred thereafter. Over the long term, um, the successional outlook for Yellowstone's forests is that, uh, and we haven't reached this point yet, but um, it's expected that between uh, 60 and 150 years from this fire, from the 1988 fires, that we should see um, mature lodgepole pine stands forming. The, and, and that would be sort of the second um, stage of, of succession. The third stage um, will be when the lodgepole pine stands get replaced by longer lived species such as spruce and fir stands. So uh, these are species that are very shade tolerant. They are able to, um, they live a very long time, and eventually what will happen is that they will outcompete and uh, out um, o overshade basically the lodgepole pine species and, um, uh, and replace them. At 250 to 500 years or so is when it's, uh, the climax community is, is expected to establish. And so these will be old growth spruce and fir forests with closed canopies. And at that point, um, we're getting into the time frame where another fire may occur and essentially restart the successional cycle. So in order to understand um, some of the mechanisms behind succession, uh, Connell and Slatyer in 1977 um, proposed a, a model that in, invoked a couple of different mechanisms that were uh, thought to explain the, the changes in species composition over time. And they proposed basically three um, mechanisms, facilitation, inhibition, and tolerance. So let's take a look at those. The facilitation mechanism um, states that early species increase the chance of later spe species establishing. So this, this was what they referred to as kind of their positive mechanism. And this mostly applies to primary succession. So if you think of a primary succession, recall that a primary succession is one that establishes on brand new geologic substrate. So there's no, there are no seeds or no, there's no vegetative materials in the soil. 
Um, and so the, the species that um, are found um, early in this primary succession are microbial species initially, but then um, oftentimes mosses and lichens um, begin to establish as well on this geologic material and begin to form a soil. So that process of soil formation is critical because that is actually facilitating establishment of other species following those um, early uh, colonizations by mosses and lichens due to the fact that they're um, initially initiating a soil formation. So this, this um, again, is a positive type of mechanism. Plants that, um, like legumes, that um, associate with rhizobium bacteria are another group of species that can facilitate the later establishment of species in a succession because, as you remember um, from the mutualism lecture, rhizobium are able to fix nitrogen. And so uh, legumes can actually increase the uh, nitrogen concentrations in the soil such that um, other plants can more easily establish. Uh, following as, uh, initial establishment by by legumes, so in both of these cases, th these these processes would facilitate the later the establishment of the later species in a succession. The an, the um, in inhibition um, mechanism states that early species decrease the chance of later species establishing. So this is a, a negative mechanism, and it's primarily based on species um, individual competitive abilities. And so obviously, um, if, if a site is colonized by a species, that site is preempted, okay? In other words, um, it's occupying the space, and so when that Indiv an individual of a species arrives, it occupies a space and doesn't allow for another species to occupy that space. So that would, of course, be a negative type of interaction where that species would prevent the establishment of a subsequent species in a successional sequence. Early species, of course, also deplete resources, right? So they take up water, they take up nutrients and so forth, and they, they can, um, which can make the site less suitable for later species. Um, they also may shade out um, other species. So by creating shade, only um, shade tolerant species um, may be able to establish um, in, in the wake of um, prior establishment of species. So this is the um, called the inhibition mechanism. And again, it, it's based on comp competition and restricting the uh, ability of later species to establish um, following an earlier species. The final mechanism is the tolerance mechanism, and um, this is basically the neutral mechanism. And it states that the chance of species establishing on, depends on dispersal ability and stress tolerance. So in this model, or this mechanism, species uh, themselves don't alter the environment either positively or negatively. So um, the, these species are able to disperse and establish in the presence of other species, and there's no positive or negative influence. And so it's, you can sort of think of it in some ways as sort of a random mechanism, okay? Uh, species that follow the tolerance mechanism are fairly tolerant of low resource levels or stressful physical conditions. Um, and so the, the, the prior presence of species in the successional sequence doesn't either positively or negatively affect their ability to establish. And I would suggest um, turning to your textbook to get some examples of these. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to disturbance. So I've kind of referred to disturbance indirectly um, as we've been talking about succession, but disturbance is uh, uh, considered a natural part of ecological systems to which plants and animals have, have evolved. And these disturbances, whether they be fire um, 
storms, floods, or so forth, uh, act to initiate um, ecological succession. The definition of disturbance, um, there are many different definitions, but the one I've uh, used and uh, um, I've used most often, and I think it, it adequately defines a disturbance, is uh, from um, a book by Pickett and White, uh, published in 1985, and they state that a disturbance is an event that disrupts population, community, or ecosystem structure, and changes resources, substrate availability, or the physical environment. So when we talk about population, community, or ecosystem structure, uh, think about you know our discussions of populations and communities and so forth. Um, in in an ecological community, structure might you know mean uh, species composition, abundance, uh, diversity, and so forth. And so a, a disturbance um, that has a dramatic effects and effect and disrupts richness, um, comp you know composition, uh, removes biomass and so forth. Um, is is considered a disturbance. Disturbances can also dramatically change resource um, availability, substrate availability, on which um, species uh, can occur, and of course dramatically alter the physical environment as well. And um, we always need to keep in mind the evolutionary side of things as well. Plants and animals um, but primary, primarily plants have evolved a variety of mechanisms, um, adaptations to, uh, to fire. One example is um, in many conifer species. Conifers tend to occur in areas that um, burn uh, frequently, and they produce thick bark um, that can protect them against the heat of a fire, unless, of course, it's a very, very hot and severe fire. Um, but a but a surface fire, a low temperature fire, um, uh, bark it can be very protective. Epicormic branching is another adaptation, and that is the ability to um, to grow new branches um, along the trunk if if other branches have been burned by a fire. Again, if if it's low enough temperature and it only does superficial damage, then trees can recover. Another adaptation that plants have is they can produce um, they produce uh, cones that uh, are stimulated to release their seeds following a fire. And I'm sorry, I guess you can't see that word too well beneath it, but this is called serotony, spelled S-E-R-O-T-I-N-Y. Um, a serotonous cone is a, a pine cone that is sealed shut by resins. And of course, a pine cone um, harbors the seeds of, of a pine tree. Um, serotonous cones uh, have resins that seal their, those cone scales and don't allow the seeds to be released until a fire uh, comes through, heats the cones to a particular temperature that melts the resins and then allows the seeds to be released into this newly um, exposed soil where nutrient availability is initially higher, there's, there's lower competition because uh, species, um, the plants have been um, destroyed by the fire, opening up um, the habitat, reducing competition, increasing light, and so forth. So that provides a good um, a seed bed and um, light conditions for reestablishment of, of pine trees. So you find um, that in areas that have a, a pretty regular fire history, you tend to find um, an increase in the number of, of tree species w that produce serotonous cones. Another adaptation that plants have um, to help them respond to fire is resprouting. This is a, a photo of um, chamise. It's a, it's a characteristic chaparral species, and this individual here you can see is re-sprouting from the base. So quite a number of species, um, especially chaparral species like manzanita, um, also produce, um, they produce burls that allow them to withstand um, 
the heat of a fire so they don't get completely destroyed and can re-sprout from the base. So this allows quicker re-establishment following, following a fire. Disturbances are characterized by um, basically three main attributes. Um, the size of the disturbance, the intensity of the disturbance, and the frequency of the disturbance. These three attributes um, are uh, interrelated. They, they affect one another. And the size, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, the, the area burned, for example. Um, intensity has to do with, um, and can be measured in different ways, the intensity of a fire might simply be the, you know, the, the, the heat of a fire. Um, it could be measured by the, the speed of winds in a hurricane, um, the amount of destruction that, that happened, and so forth. Okay. Um, the other element um, is frequency, that is how frequent the disturbances occur. And this is sometimes uh, characterized as return interval. And we've, we saw that in the, the Yellowstone fire example, where the return interval of fires is anywhere between 100 and 500 years. So this is an indicator of, of how frequent a disturbance returns to a particular location. When we consider all of these together, um, we refer to this as the disturbance regime. It, the, these factors define what's called the disturbance regime. And every, every disturbance has a particular um, combination of characteristic size of, of that disturbance, the characteristic intensities and frequencies. So let's take a look. Um, I want to focus particularly in on frequency because frequency can have a very important influence on um, communities in terms of the species abun uh, uh, composition and abundance. So this example is um, an example that from um, the New Jersey Pine Barrens, where uh, in a particular, uh, depending upon um, the location in, in this region, and the Pine Barrens actually is a pretty large area. It's actually in, the s in um, central New Jersey, sort of mid-latitude New Jersey. And um, it's dominated by uh, pine and oak species. And it's a very large area. I forget how large it is, but it's considered a biosphere reserve. Um, probably never thought that New Jersey had it <laughs> could qualify as having a biosphere reserve, but it does. And I worked for quite a few years um, at a field research station, uh, a Rutgers field station that's, that, that's based in, in the Pine Barrens doing some of my postdoctoral research. So I'm pretty familiar with this area and it's a good example of how the frequency of fire can influence the composition and abundance of species in an ecological community. When um, in areas where, in the Pine Barrens, where you have very frequent fires, and that is the return interval would, would be less than 15 years, which is very, very frequent. What you find is that you get um, a very characteristic kind of set of species. And in these situations with frequent fires, you get a, a dwarf pitch pine forest. So pitch pine is a common pine species in the Pine Barrens. And one of the morphs of pitch pine is a dwarf um, version. And the dwarf versions occur in these areas where you have very frequent fires. And they also produce serotonous pine cones. And, um, and you know, which, as I mentioned, um, allow for the release of the seeds following a fire. When fires are less frequent, um, that is, when the return interval is between 20 and 40 years, you get um, a shift in species from a dwarf pitch pine forest to a pitch pine forest. It should be noted that the um, dwarf pitch pine and pitch pine, of course, are very closely related. Um, and, uh, and so the, the pitch pine has, the dwarf pitch pine has been highly selected for by um, highly frequent fires, whereas the um, pitch pine uh, 
populations occur where fire is less frequent. And so there is less of a selection for the dwarf pitch pine um, morph. As um, the return interval of fires increases to 50 or, or more years, you tend to get um, uh, forests dominated by oak species. Oaks are less tolerant of fires than, than the pine species. Uh, the pine species, as I noted, have um, you know, fairly thick bark that can withstand um, fires. And, um, but the oaks uh, do not. They, they have moderately thick or thin bark depending upon the species. And so they're not very tolerant of fires. And so um, they do not occur when fire intervals are, are fairly frequent. But over 50 years, um, oaks will tend to outcompete the, the pitch pine species, overtop them, overshadow them. And um, over a long enough period of time, um, without fire, the oaks will tend to dominate and form the climax community. So in the, in the pine barrens, um, whether or not you are in a dwarf pitch pine forest, a pitch pine forest, or an oak forest, um, those different communities will um, indicate the whether you know how frequent um, fires have occurred in in those particular areas so frequency of disturbance can play a very important role in the the composition and abundance of species in ecological communities